Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Friday, November 8th. It's good to have you on board, everyone. Early Happy Veterans Day to all the veterans listening to or watching the show. Thank you for your service. This episode is brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers. Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. All right, my guest today is Army Major Austin Schwartz. Not the first Army officer we've had on the show, but we, we, we've had a couple, but it's a, it's a rarity. But Austin is the third prize winner in this year's Naval Institute Marine Corps Essay Contest. And he's joining from Newport, Rhode Island, where he is a student at the Naval War College. Major Schwartz, Austin, uh, welcome to the show. Hey, good morning, Bill. Thanks for having me on. Honestly, it's an honor. All right. Um, because you're an Army person and a lot of our listeners are Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, starting with your MOS in the Army. Sure. All right. Well, so I'm a 19 Alpha Charlie 6, which means that I'm an armor officer trained in reconnaissance and security operations. Wow. So I've led armor, cavalry, and infantry formations on the M1 Abrams main battle tank, the Bradley fighting vehicle, and uh, most recently the Striker infantry carrier uh, vehicle. And uh, my first unit was the Armor Brigade Combat Team over in 1st Cav Division. And while I was there, I did a rotation to Germany as part of Operation Atlantic Resolve, where we had the opportunity to train with partner nations at the Joint Multinational Readiness Center. Uh, I finished that tour off with a rotation to the National Training Center, so I was lucky enough to maneuver tanks in the plains of Europe and in the deserts of California. And then my second unit was the 2nd Cavalry Regiment out in Vilsic, Germany. Um, so there I was part of a striker brigade, and I served as a CAV squadron planner, so reconnaissance and security primarily for the entire brigade, and then a CAV troop commander and a headquarters and headquarters troop commander as well. Uh, while I was there, I took part in Saber Strike 16, where we drove the regiment all the way from Vilsec, Germany, to Tapa, uh, Estonia. And we conducted two wet gap crossings at the time uh, with the help of our German and British allies. Really memorable and, and really showed the difficulty of that. Uh, I also supported deployments to Poland, Latvia, Finland, Italy, and the country of Georgia. Um, so following that, I taught as a small group leader at the Army's Maneuver Captain's Career Course, where I taught O3 Army and Marines and some foreign officers as well, uh, how to plan operations um, at the company to brigade level. And in that role, I was sent back to Germany to review the program of instruction for the multinational, uh, the Joint Multinational Training Group Ukraine, or JMTGU, uh, courses for Ukrainian NCOs, junior officers, and company commanders, which was another amazing experience just to see how hard they were working for you know their current fight. Yeah, when was that? Uh, that was just a year ago. Oh, wow. So so during the combat operations, during the wartime. Yeah. So they were getting so we we have a lot of people across Europe um, and it's run by different nations. Uh, the U.S. part of that's in Germany and we bring them over. They get trained up and then they go back. Cool. And then uh, so before I left for the Naval War College, I promised the command sergeant major of the Maneuver Center of Excellence, uh, Command Sergeant Major Dotson that I'd put some brain power towards the Indo-Pacific fight. And that really led to this article. So that's me. Awesome. Awesome. Well, congrats on your prize winning essay. The title is Marine Corps. The Marine Corps and Army must integrate armor into amphibious ops. It's in the November issue of Proceedings. And uh, you can find it in the print issue if you've got that at home, or you can find it on our website just by searching on that title. Um, so our audience has heard a lot about Marine Corps Force Design 2030, which the Marine Corps now just calls Force Design, uh, including how the Marine Corps divested of its tanks several years ago. So if an amphibious operation called for tanks now, is the Army ready to pick up that mission? Well, I definitely argue in my essay that we're not. And uh, I think we're definitely lagging behind the capabilities that China's People's uh, Liberation Army are developing. And that doesn't mean we wouldn't execute the order if it came down, but I believe we lost a lot of the capabilities that we relied on in previous wars. And it's going to take a lot if we're trying to get that knowledge back, but it has to be something we decide on and we push towards. So your article includes some really relevant history from World War II in the Pacific. Uh, tell us about the role that tanks or you, you had introduced us to a new acronym, which was MPF. 
yeah. mobile protected firepower. Uh, so what, what role did MPF or tanks play in amphibious operations in the Pacific in World War II? Sure. Well, Bill, if you don't mind, first, I got to give a little bit of perspective, right? So tanks are designed to support infantry formations first and foremost. And that really came out of World War I where they were invented. Uh, there, artillery may have been the king of battle, but the deadliest weapon on the battlefield was really the machine gun. Hmm. Uh, so the U.S. Army Marine Corps saw that the tank was a primary ways to counter that threat when inf infantry formations were trying to you know, move towards their objective. So let's kind of take a look at what that looks like, right? So let's say you're an infantry unit and you're moving to take your objective. It could be a hill, it could be a city center, it could be cliffs overwatching a beach. Sooner or later, you're going to run into the enemy. And the enemy is going to set their defensive kill zone up in a way where you must maneuver through open fields of fire. And they're going to, they're going to set their machine guns up so that they can take advantage of that. And if you don't have a way of suppressing the enemy there, uh, you're, you're essentially having your infantry just run through machine gun fire in order to hope they make it to that objective. Now, of course, artillery can be used, aviation can be used. But what we've kind of found is when they have fortified pillboxes or they have armored vehicles, realistically, you're not going to be able to suppress them all. And one machine gun can do so much damage to an infantry squad, company, et cetera. They, it, you really want to be able to bring to the fight some protected firepower that that commander can say, oh, I need you to fire there. I need you to fire there. I need you to fire there. That's kind of where the tank comes in, right? And so yeah. when we say mobile protective firepower, I'm a tanker. I love tanking. I'll do the tank side, but it could be a lot of different things, right? So some argue that in today's day and age, it should be a uh, unmanned vehicle that has armor and a gun. So you don't have to put a mm. lot of weight onto it. So with a crew and all the support that goes into them, I don't really care what it is. And that's why we're using mobile protective firepower. But at the end of the day, we need something that the infantry can get behind while it engages, suppresses, and destroys the enemy machine gun nests so the infantry can continue moving forward. And, it, you know, when we look at the amphibious assault, realistically, what you're really doing there is that same thing, except for first, you have to swim your way there. And the entire time you're swimming your way there, you are essentially sitting duck other than, you know, what artillery and aviation and, and some other indirect fires are doing for you. And you want to be able to naval gunfire support, right? Yeah, that's, absolutely. Yeah. Including naval gunfire support. If, if, you know, in today's day and age, what that looks like is interesting, but I think that's what the Marine Corps is counting on with uh, their force design, right? But anyway, as those tanks are coming in, I mean, what we really learned in World War II is as we're taking beaches, uh, we had a few hiccups. And the first was, that our tanks weren't amphibious. So an AM tank is an amphibious tank, nice easy name, um, and that's capable of swimming. Uh, our first tanks weren't, so they were relegated to the later waves. Infantry had to go in first against those defensive positions, secure a beachhead so that a boat could move up close enough to the shore to actually drop the tanks so that they could get onto the shore itself. Um, and then the second hiccup we had was the first tanks that went there only had a 37 millimeter main gun. And mm -hmm. the reports that were written about this essentially said that wasn't enough to destroy enemy pillboxes. So just not enough firepower there to do the job that the infantry required of them. Over time, we developed better connectors, which is essentially, you know, moving uh, those formations from the big boats to the shore itself. And we actually developed AM tanks and then uh, what you call AM tracks, which are amphibious uh, tractors. So those are really the first troop carriers that were used to get onto the onto the beach itself for the uh, the Marines and the uh, the Army infantry, and once we developed light tanks that were actually amphibious and had those bigger guns, they were actually able to do their job, and they were able to help protect the infantry as they took those beaches. Um, and the secondary thing that tanks kind of do in that role is become a mobile reserve. So once they do take the beach, now they can move much quicker than the infantry can to reinforce any of the defensive positions that that commander in probably one of the most hectic situations you can imagine taking a beach and then trying to hold it so reinforcements can come can move those reinforcements to any places that their defenses are lacking and mm. if the enemy makes a mistake the mobility of that firepower can be used to exploit the enemy either break through or you know pursue them gotcha that's super helpful <laughs> thanks for uh Thanks for tank, tanking 101 for uh, our naval audience. Really, really great. <laughs> yeah, I hope um, that wasn't too much. No, no, it was it was perfect. It was perfect. Very helpful to me as well. Uh, you gave me some terrific context. Um, 
So the Army was an amphibious force in World War II, uh, and joint doctrine, as you point out in your article, joint doctrine and Army doctrine still show an Army role in amphibious operations. Does the Army train for those? Is it equipped for those missions uh, today? Yeah, so there's like a, a bit of a disconnect, right? So the Joint Chiefs, they're putting in their publications, uh, like absolutely Marines lead the way in planning this, but the Army has a role in it. And when you start looking at things like uh, Joint Pub 3-02, amphibious operations, you see it, it talking specifically about integrating armor into amphibious operations, which it doesn't say you have to, but it says is an option. And when you kind of start coming down on that doctrine, to where the army, where the rubber really meets the road, right? So the army has um, army technique publications, and those are uh, written for the platoon, written for the company, the the battalion. There's a complete lack of anything amphibious there. Mm -hmm. But at the higher echelons, it kind of mimics what the uh, joint pub says, and it says, "Hey, you can absolutely integrate armor into this, and you probably should in some cases." So somewhere along the way, that really wasn't the prioritization of the army in that regard. Now, that's not to say that the army's not training in some roles, right? We have the 25th Infantry Division out in Hawaii, and they've been training with the Marines out in the Pacific and our partners uh, just nonstop, right? The last thing that they did uh, was actually Super Garuda Shield. But when they're training, they don't have uh, organic armor with them. They are a light infantry unit. So realistically, you're seeing a lot of uh, mimicry of what the Marines are doing with their lighter force right now, too, which absolutely serves a purpose. But we're seeing, um, you know, air assault operations and we're seeing Zodiacs coming ashore and putting small teams of reconnaissance or infantry there, which, again, with the current plan of using exquisite fires to kind of be the, the main force there can work. But if we have to take a beachhead we aren't integrating that mobile tech to firepower. And I think that's probably a bit of an issue. Uh, and then the question is, you know, so I've been in for 13, going on 14 years. I've never once been asked to plan an amphibious assault uh, with, with tanks in any way, shape or form. So we mm -hmm. have the Armor Basic Leaders course, and that's where they train lieutenants, uh, armor lieutenants. And it's a, it's a tank course overall. There's nothing about amphibious, not, not even just even getting dropped off somewhere in any of the scenarios that are based out there. And then in MCCC, where we train infantry armor uh, captains on how to plan at the battalion or brigade level and at the company level, we do have a few things in the Pacific, but it's essentially you're starting off in Korea already. And there's nothing about taking a beachhead. It's just assumed that we would be in the Pacific and we're ready to fight from that. And it's essentially just standard ground warfare and tanking operations in that regard. The Abrams does have the ability, which is our main battle tank, and we've just created the M10 Booker, which is a not a tank, but it is mobile protective firepower, but it looks like a tank. It looks like a baby Abrams, but they're both very heavy. The Abrams can have a deep uh, waiting kit attachment, which the Marines used to use all the time. Essentially, it was a snorkel, which allowed it to wade up to six feet. Um, but I've actually never seen those in the army. I've never inventoried them. I've never mm. laid eyes on them. So my assumption is they're probably in a warehouse somewhere, but I don't think it's ever made its way to the army now that the Marines have given up that. A waiting kit is not an amphibious tank. And I, I would invite any of our users to to watch some of the YouTube videos of what China has been doing, but their, um, their new amphibious tanks can float in the water and they've been doing gunneries off the side, floating the water, firing onto a shore. And that's that's not a capability we have right now. Yeah, I think that was a, a cover shot that we used for the, uh, the start of the American Sea Power, the War of 2026 scenario last year in the December issue uh, was a picture of those PLA uh, tanks, uh, that floating tanks and firing on shore targets. Uh, it, 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 you're, you're right. It's a, it's, a, it's a frightening capability and one that they have explicitly built for that you know, Taiwan scenario or, or an, another island scenario. So um, so you mentioned an, an exercise called Garuda Shield. Um, there's a whole bunch of other exercise in the past few years. Uh, Marine Corps and Army have increased their joint combined exercise in the Western Pacific uh, earlier this year. And in your article, you mentioned exercise Balakatan in the Philippines, where there was a focus on island seizure operations. Uh, did Army tanks operate from the sea during during any of those exercises? So the uh, short answer is no. 
Um, so Balakatan, what we saw there was the, realistically the use of Marines as forward observers and army brought high Mars to that fight. So mm -hmm. it's that exquisite targeting again, uh, which has a price tag. And then we did see tanks from the first armored division brought over to Australia as part of uh, talisman saber, but it was, a ne they were really used as, um, op four or, uh, opposition forces against the Marines. Oh. And, uh, it was not an amphibious assault by any means. It was tanks ashore and how are Marines going to get ashore and be able to fight those tanks. Uh, so realistically, um, are we integrating tanks over there? Yes, definitely logistics that are being built there and how we can support those. So that that is good. But as far as using mobile protected firepower as part of an amphibious assault, uh, I haven't seen heads or tails, and I, I don't think it's in the cards right now. Got it. Uh, toward the end of your article, you write you write this: the joint forces priorities indicate it has moved past modern amphibious assault to the postmodern in which small distributed teams will conduct exquisite targeting to destroy enemy positions and armor to enable lightly armored infantry to seize the beachhead. So um, we, we, you've touched on this a little bit already, but what do you see as some of the problems in the movement to that postmodern uh, you know, capability set? All right, well, Bill, first I gotta say, um, first and foremost, I hope it works, right? So. I'm airborne qualified. I have walked off of a perfectly good airplane, which a lot of people thought was crazy. I can't imagine driving my tank off of a perfectly good boat and hoping that I'm going to swim ashore on that. I just, <laughs> there's a lev level of insanity that I really respect in uh, our Marines and everyone who came before back in World War II who did these things. But uh, of course, if I'm ordered to, I'm going to do it, right? But so what's the problem with this postmodern method? Well, I think there's a lot of goodness to it, but I think it's also comes down to kind of the the size of what you think that conflict's going to be right so for me it's the cost of pre precision guided missiles that we're going to be using um to knock out things that really comparatively have a much lower cost uh china the pla has an obscene amount of uh, armored vehicles and it has an obscene amount of soldiers and i don't see a scenario where if they start taking island chains that they're not going to use their both their army and their marine corps which both ha both have amphibious units themselves and then you can just replace once you've taken those islands uh the amphibious units with your standard ground pounders who can also defend those islands i don't see mm -hmm. a scenario where they don't saturate that environment uh enough targets that the idea of using these ex ex super expensive exquisite um guided missile systems is just too too costly for us yeah, you're talking uh, about you're talking about high Mars. You're talking about for the Marine Corps, uh, the naval strike missile, which is a sea denial capability, right? But right. again, that's you know uh, we, we've got high demand, uh, low density assets there that are, as you point out, very very expensive. Right, and I think really what it comes down to is we have this idea that we will stop them, and it's not going to come into a situation where we need to be taking back islands. Uh, and it works, right? It works as long as we get, we never let them get past that point. If the Marines are forward, uh, deployed and they are part of this kill train where they are the eyes and ears for the joint force. And we are able to stop them before they're able to take definitely Taiwan. And then, you know, as, assuming that they're not going to try to isolate Taiwan first, which frankly is what I would do, um, any of these other islands, then it's a fantastic idea. And you're using those those missiles on actual ships, you know, things that are worth the money of using it against a target that's that expensive. I think where it kind of falls apart is if they do start grabbing these islands and we have to go back there and we have to seize them. And again, this is a certainly a I, I stand where I sit scenario, but mm -hmm. as a maneuverist, um, what I've always been told and what I've learned and what makes sense to me is you have to put boots on ground to seize any amount of land and you're never going to truly be able to do that with air power or you know um, indirect fires of any sort so until you can actually put marines or soldiers there to seize it plant the flag and say it's ours now and make sure that the enemy's completely off of it clear it it's not really safe and i think that if we get into a fight where with uh the pla who has more like overshadows us in almost every metric when it comes to amphibious maneuver forces 
um, I think that there is a chance that the silver bullet doesn't work. They take these islands and that we have to go back there and slug our way through it. If that makes sense to you, Bill. Oh, it totally makes sense. And and slug our way through a contest that is an extreme away game for the United States, an extreme home game, uh, you know, for China and the South China Sea or Taiwan Strait scenario. Um, with what we've what we all know now is uh, you know the U.S. We, we just don't have enough numbers, right? So our maybe there are some you know far superior capabilities, specific capabilities, but but uh, you know numbers count, numbers matter, and uh, yeah, the order of battle is is always an, an important aspect. Um, so so we've discussed the problem set, I think, very well. Um, so now walk us through the recommendations you have in your proceedings article to get the Army and the Marine Corps ready to tackle amphibious operations together again. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a little bit because this article is originally 4,500, and then I trimmed it down uh, multiple times. Um, so there might be a little bit new, but so number one, I think we 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 need to start working on the equipment and that's connectors that can carry these vehicles. And then uh, realistically, it's an AM tank that's capable of doing it. And in the paper I, I put forth, maybe the M10 Booker can be modified in some way, but realistically uh, some, some people have said, hey, that is still a very heavy tank. They're not wrong. It is still a very, very heavy tank. And I am not an engineer, so there's a very good chance we'd have to go back to the drawing board and make something from scratch, a light tank that's capable. But bottom line is we need to we need to give the infantry that mobile tech to firepower. So we need that. While those are being developed, because we all know that that takes forever in the yeah. DOD, I think a, an easy win is um, taking a look at the Marines uh, amphibious or assault amphibious course, right? where they train their leaders on how to do these operations. And I, th I think we start getting some junior armor officers over there. Maybe we even send in some uh, field grades to like take a look at the POI and say, hey, how can we get army in this as well? And I think we, even if it's a few at first, I think we start getting a few of these army officers to understand what these operations look like, even if it's not on our, our vehicles at first, just to wrap their heads around it, right? Because as they continue through the ranks, they'll be the ones that make some of these decisions going forward on the best mm -hmm. way to lead the army and the Marines kind of together on this. And, yeah. you know, just having them together talking is is part of the battle. Cause I mean, you know, as well as I do, Bill, that once you have smart people sitting down and having conversations, like good things can start happening. Um, the doctrine needs to be looked at. And I think a lot of that could also come from the uh, Assault Amphibious School. I, I, I spoke to their XO directly, and they're trying to pull in the ability to kind of revise some of that doctrine at their level. And I think that if the Army, the Maneuver Center of Excellence, took that seriously, they would say, hey, let's kind of work on this together. Um, both Marines and Army are both fantastic at writing doctrine, but you know, when they can overlap, it's always better. Yeah, where is the uh, Marine Corps' Assault Amphibious uh, School? Uh, I don't want to lie to you, but I'm pretty sure it's in California. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, which is very far away from the Maneuver Center of Excellence. So that's a, that's a bit of a flight to send them over where, there. Where, where is the Army's Maneuver Center of Excellence? That's at Fort Moore, Georgia. Uh, Georgia. Okay. So opposite yeah. coast. Yeah, right. Um, and then, okay. So we talked doctrine. We talked a bit of training. I think we need to up those training exercises. I think something I didn't put in the article, but in the first draft, the 25th ID is based out of Hawaii. I, I would propose we, we change it to the 25th Amphibious Infantry Division. Hmm. And I would also, so uh, the Army has realized that our airborne uh, troopers require mobile protective firepower, and that's why the M10 Booker was created. So battalions of tanks are going, or mobile protective firepower are going over to the 82nd Airborne and the 101st because once they seize an airfield, which is a joint forcible entry, much akin to an amphibious operation of seizing a beachhead, they need the, that mobile tech firepower to hold their defense after because you're in enemy territory and they're going to be fighting back for it, right? Is it, I, is it air droppable? Is the, is the Booker? No. It's, it's a, not. It's a, no, it's seize, too heavy. Seize, yeah, seize an airfield and then something like a... Uh, a C5 has to has to land uh, to 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 deliver it. Okay. Right, and but it can the C5 can take uh, or a C7, but it can take two. Uh, it can take two of the Bookers as opposed to one Abrams, and they can be combat 
ready when they come out. So that's right. that's the benefit yeah. there. Yeah, C5, C7 team can can deliver these things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the point on that is uh, I think that we should get the 25th to become the amphibious infantry division. I think that we give them some tanks, even if it's the 10 booker to begin with until we can get the M tanks, the uh, AM tanks there so they can get used to it. And this is above my pay grade, but in a perfect world, kind of akin to uh, World War II, I would put a regiment of Marines right into that division as well so that they mm -hmm. can become kind of the poster's child of that jointness working right then and there. Though I'm sure a lot of people above my pay grade would tell me that that's a horrible idea for countless <laughs> reasons. Um, but uh, I think realistically, that's it. We need the equipment, we need the doctrine, and then we need to start making moves on this training. And uh, other than the, you know, ABLE and M triple C, adding it to their curriculum, that's that's where we're at right now. Yeah, no, fantastic. Thank you for walking through that. Uh, so. Um, methodically and art articulately that even a Navy guy could, could understand it. I, I appreciate it. So we're running short on time. Uh, do you have any saved rounds or can you just uh, share with us what the Army is planning to do with you after you finish up at the Naval War College? Sure. Uh, yeah, so I, I found out yesterday I'm going to be going back to 2CR, so the 2nd Cavalry Regiment in, uh, in Germany. And then uh, I'll be what uh, you Navy guys call an OPSO. So it's the S3 of the squadron. Um, so we'll be the cavalry squadron for the, the second cavalry regiment. But what that really means is our job is to go out in front of the infantry and try to hold the line until they're ready in their defense. So if it goes past Ukraine and they go into Europe, 2CR has got to be some of the first ones there and ready to go. Got it. And uh, that unit, is that a uh, M1 Abrams tank unit or is it uh, strikers or what have you got in the in, in the TOE? Yeah, so that they it's an interesting unit. It is a striker unit, but they upgrade the strikers uh, kind of similar to what the Marines are looking to do a little bit. So our we have what are called ICV or infantry carrying vehicles J, which are javelins, which means that it has a remote weapon system that has a 50 cal and a javelin up top so it can fire a javelin while on the move um, and then the other vehicles we have there are called the icvd the dragoon which has a 30 millimeter cannon on it which uh is a remote turret uh which is kin to the bradley in its capability so a gunner sits inside with a joystick and controls that cannon that's correct yeah got it Got it. Cool. That sounds like a good, a cool piece of tech. Um, so uh, this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate it and I appreciate the article. Thanks for writing for proceedings. It's, uh, you know, I, I do tell people we're open to um, not just Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard. That's our sort of tends to be our focus area, but we do publish Army, Air Force, Space Force, uh, and and foreign military officers uh, and, and enlisted folks uh, quite frequently. Uh, and I think it also speaks to the fact that our um, uh, our essay contests are judged in the blind. We do not know who the author is and we don't care. Uh, we're just looking to publish uh, the best ideas that are presented uh, the most you know, coherently and succinctly, which yours was. So my guest today has been uh, Army Major Austin Schwartz. His article is in the November issue of Proceedings. It's titled, The Marine Corps and Army Must Integrate Armor in Amphibious Ops. It won third prize in our 2024 Marine Corps essay contest. Uh, so Austin, congrats again on the essay. Thanks for writing for us and we hope you'll write for us again. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you for your time, Bill. This episode was brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. Mark your calendars for 11 December. We'll be hosting our annual Defense Forum Washington at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. The topic for this year is building and sustaining the naval force structure the nation needs. We have a terrific lineup of speakers. You can find more information and register at usni.org slash events. And finally, if you're a member of the Naval Institute, thank you. If you're not yet, please join us and start receive, receiving Proceedings Magazines. 
member discounts and newsletters. Just go to usni.org forward slash join to become a member today. And until next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.